Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Commission Breath. Brandon Love here with Tom Moffitt. And today we are going to chat about five ways to get more approvals from lenders and do it in less time. Before we dive into things, I just wanted to send out a big thank you for everyone who joined us at our Tango Ontario launch party. It was a fantastic night and we had people come from the West Coast, from Montreal, even someone flew up from Florida and someone down from Sault Ste. Marie. So we really appreciate you all making an effort to celebrate with us. And for those of you who missed it, keep an eye out for future parties and gatherings that we'll all be at. Yeah, that was a good time. The the servers had to kick us out at a certain time because they're like, all right, guys, you guys are drinking too much. No, I'm just kidding. It was because we went past time, but uh, everyone was enjoying themselves. Just wanted to keep staying all night. So yeah, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, was feeling a little rough the next day, but uh, I'm blaming that on the Negronis and a couple pints with some of our listeners. It's that... the sugar in the Negronis, man. Yeah. It's not because you drank too much. It's the sugar that's in it. Really hurts you. Exactly. All right, but let's dive into it because we got a few good points today. And this is important stuff to think about, even if you're an established player in the game, because certain things here you might not be doing that if a few small tweaks, a text here, a call here, a little gift once in a while can really change your whole experience. Yeah, and we'll start off with... First of all, where are you placing the file? Why are you placing the file? And is there any doubt in your mind that this file is not going to get approved? Like from day one, I've never really tried to just throw shit at the wall when it comes to submitting files. I don't know what the normal practice is for brokers. I've always been under the impression you submit to one lender, you get the approval there, you don't submit to multiple because obviously you're going to have to cancel files. I think that is normal practice. I could be wrong. But if you aren't doing that, then please just make sure you review your file first before submitting to a lender. And when you do submit to a lender, submit to one. Don't do multiple at once. There's the odd occasion where you have to do that. If there's like a file you have to get done in a pinch or you're maybe on the fence of whether that file can get done with that certain lender, there's going to be occasions. But for the most part, best practice is to submit it to one lender. Yeah, and use tools like your rate sheets, your lender spotlight, really narrow it down so that you feel confident in knowing that, okay, this fits the lender's guidelines. Maybe give the BRM a BDM a quick call or email and say, hey, this is the file I have to push through. Do you think it's going to be a fit? Because they'll be quick to kill it if it's not or if it's on the fence. And then that just saves you the whole time of going through the whole review process before seeing that. Yeah, I do agree, but I also disagree to a certain extent with the BDM portion of that. I know just because when it comes to BDM, sometimes they can oversell their products that they just want you to submit in. I've been burned of that in the past where I've been promised the world, but got a decline right away. And sometimes it's because the BDM just didn't know a certain nuance from the guideline perspective, because the underwriters obviously know a bit more. So that I would be a bit cautious on, but you would also kind of get to know your BDM and whether you're more confident in their answer that they're giving you yeah it's it's like us brokers like some of us know our shit other ones are just yeah kind of exactly. it. and that's the same in the bdm space some of them are super knowledgeable and like will help you structure files in a way that will actually get it approved and some of them just want to have like as many files go through hoping that they get a decent funding and it looks good on their numbers yeah i think that's it has been changing a little bit actually now that i think of it because i Lenders are more cognizant on funding ratios. And I think that starts with the BDM. And I think they know that. So I think it has gone a little better in that sense. Yeah. So we're transitioning right into that point anyways. But point two is just have really good BDM relationships. I know this was like a TSN turning point for my business where I went for pints with a few BDMs and just got to really know their products, their style, how they like to communicate. And it's so much easier now. Like I can fire off a quick text and be like, hey, my file's submitted. I've got a quick COF on this. And they'll be like, no worries. I'm messaging the underwriter right now. And sometimes I get turnaround time in like 20 minutes. There was one yesterday, one of the big lenders, and I shot him a text. And I was like, hey, man, hate to put you in a bind here, but I got this file late. The COF's tomorrow. Got some hair on the file. Do you mind taking a look at it? And he's like, no problem. 45 minutes later, I had the commitment. Damn, that's awesome, man. I kind of have a feeling of who that is. We won't say, but we'll have a chat after. It really does come down to, it is a relationship business. Like there's a human element to it. It's not just like, yes, we all stick to guidelines, but at the end of the day, if you have a better relationship with your BDM, then chances are your file may get looked at quicker because they're going to flag in their underwriter to bring it in and take a closer look first. 
Exactly. A lot of the times that underwriter has to go and say to, to them, oh, well, I need X exception. If you have good relationships, you can do that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and that was what I focused on when I joined my last brokerage is I had a whole set of new BDMs for the most part. And I was like, all right, so I kind of learned the hard way of going through my first three years in the business of just really kind of not understanding that I have a set BDM, I have a set underwriter. Some lenders, you have multiple different underwriters. So that would be one question I would ask the BDM is like, hey, do I have a dedicated underwriter when I submit files? And then if that's the case, then you would do the same with the underwriter as you're doing with the BDM. Create that strong relationship. I personally, not that you want to buy their love, but I gave a small gift to most of them when I first joined, like my core lenders. I sent out a nice like gift to their home. And it was just a nice way of saying like, hey, I'm looking forward to your partnership and working with you in the future. Yeah. And another important thing here is like, don't be afraid to ask for things in return. Like I was at the launch party, I talked to several lenders and some of them were like, why don't we get more of your personal book of business? And I was like, honestly, I have great relationships with these couple of people here. When I call them, they kind of push things along and they're like, well, you never asked that of us. And I'm like, that's a fair point. I never asked it from you, but now I'm going to going forward mm -hmm. and we'll see how it works out. Yeah, exactly. Love that. And I mean, we touched a bit on it. Why don't we just kind of transition to underwriters? It's a lot of the same points that we made with BDMs do the same with underwriters and underwriters are crucial, man. Like if you have a dedicated underwriter with that lender, they are the person that's going to give you that approval or not. So yes, create that strong relationship up front, develop that over time, get to know them on a personal level. But on top of that, you want to see what their day to day is on the back end because every system with every lender is going to be completely different. And I just learned over the past year that certain nuances with each lender, like to give you an example, one of them, if you send a message in the portal, they have a response time that they're obligated to get back to you within, I think, 30 or 45 minutes of that message coming in. So if you're sending a message in the portal, it better damn well be important because they have to take their eyes off of the file they're working on, go into the portal and answer that message that you sent to them. So that was kind of an eye opener knowing that, hey, if I'm going to send something in here, it's got to be very, very important. Exactly. And ask them how their document submissions go and, and how they review things. Like, for example, I had a lender and I said, just show me kind of your back end of what it looks like. And he showed me, he's like, if you put all your documents in this one area, it merges them all into one massive file that I have to like sort through. He's like, if you do this step, it individualizes them and I can pull out the things I need easier. And I'm like, oh, wow, I'll always do it that way to make your life easier. And he's like, I wish everyone would ask me that, but like people don't and I can't go and say this is the process I want. And I was like, well, I actually think you could go and say that. But the key thing here is like, think about how you want to be treated by your clients. Like if a client dumps a bunch of useless, shitty documents to you and you have to go back and be like, that's not the right thing. This is okay. And you have to kind of sort through it adds to irritation, frustration, and makes you like love that client less. It's the same thing with underwriters. We're their clients in this case. And if we just try to throw things in there and hope it gets by, it just creates frustration and animosity from them. Yeah. And that's often going to cause a bit more time for them to actually jump on your file because they're dreading that. It's like us as brokers, like you mentioned, if if you know those documents are coming in so messy, it's like, ah, I'm just going to push that one off till later. I'm going to get to this one where I can underwrite that in 30 minutes versus this one's going to take me hours just to compile all the docs coming in. So it's no different with the underwriters. Yeah, it's a human nature side of things, right? And I actually had an underwriter tell me that he triage based on who gives him clean documents, clean submission notes and files he can review. And then anyone who gives him like crappy stuff to deal with, he just puts it to the bottom of the pile. The thing I said to him is I'm like, they're always going to be more frustrated with you and complain yeah. to the BDM about you. But at the end of the day, you make it easier for people to work with you. They're going to want to work with you more. Yeah. And it's like, if you're a rookie and you're listening to this and you're like, well, that BDM or BRM might be looking at other people's files first because they know I'm new and I haven't worked with them too much. There's a chance for you to get to the top of the pile, even if you don't have certain influx of deals coming in. If that underwriter knows you on a more personal relationship and you have super clean submission notes, deals coming in, and they know it's easy to underwrite, they'll likely pick your file over someone that may be doing 10 times the amount of files as you, but they just come in a mess. For sure. It's worth spending the extra time getting your file dialed in understanding the process of who you're submitting to and just giving that little extra 15, 20 minutes of care makes the world a difference. 
Yeah. And the last point I'll make on the underwriters and knowing their process and what they like specifically is to give you one example with one of our big partners that we work with. What I do is if there's a COF or something urgent on the file, actually every file I do this, but I'll highlight the urgency in a subject line in the email because when a submission comes in through his platform, it oftentimes gets lost because he's getting all of these notifications in from even document uploads. Like if someone's loading a document one at a time, like every hour, it's a separate email that he gets in. So it all gets lost in the shuffle. So what I do is I have like a highlighted subject line with the submission notes in the email right after I submit the file. I'd be like, hey, this one's a, a quick close COF, whatever the case is, but it's a one borrower application, AAA client should take you no time to underwrite. Like I'll have some incentive in there for him to pick it up. Obviously not every file is going to be like that, but if there is any of that, these are kind of like little tricks that you learn over time and you learn what they want and it makes it a lot easier for your file to get approved and approved faster. Yeah. And the inverse of that is if there's like something where the file isn't perfect, like let's say there's a credit blip or there's something that they're going to uncover. Don't wait for them to find it out. These aren't stupid people. They're going to discover it. Send them an email or give them a call and explain the nuance of the file. It, like it's a little courtesy, but it goes a long way. That's a great point, actually. Yeah. All right. On that, we will jump to point four, which is your submission notes. And I've seen through the brokerage some pretty bad submission notes, just looking at files and kind of doing internal audits and stuff like that. It's very easy, especially if you use Finmo, to make your submission notes look good. Generate the auto submission notes, go through kind of your discovery call notes, add the two year averages, add how you came up with the breakdowns add all the relevant information they're going to ask for and just clean up and remove some of the BS that's auto populated and you have a really nice submission note. It's going to take you 10 minutes to do, not even. And it makes a world of difference. Yeah. And it does go a long way. Like you said, 10 minutes of time. And yeah, when I'm submitting a file, it is one of the things I don't like doing. I'll admit like having a full cleaned up submission notes, but I know doing that, it's really going to help me going forward for that approval. So it's definitely worth that 10 minutes of putting in the effort. And like you said, with Finmo, I don't know what the other platforms do, but the submission notes are fantastic. And I wish I had that earlier on in my career, but they're not perfect. They do come out as sentences for the most part for a lot of the lines. And for me as an underwriter, I just want the quick hit notes. Like, what do I need to know? I don't need like a full sentence on, sometimes I don't like including all of the assets in there if they don't really need that for that file. Like, why do I have to list every single little asset, every single little credit and liability? I want the quick hit notes of what that underwriter needs. Yeah, I think you can really clean it up, make it look tidy. Also, just getting into a system of doing that allows you to remember like certain things like have the auto limit increase on for Scotia files, yeah. request a higher prepayment privilege, little things that you save yourself steps of having to do it down the line. Also a good time here to double check your closing dates, make sure you haven't screwed anything up there. Just review your details and make sure it's fine tuned and ready to go as best as possible. Obviously things change, dates get moved around down payment amounts, shuffle, that's going to happen, but you should have your best version going through here, not just submit your first draft. Yeah. You just gave two quick, real gold nuggets there with Scotia. I remember speaking to our BRM and he mentioned like a lot of files that come in, like nobody really asked for those 2020 prepayment privileges. He's like, why do you ask for those? Like, well, why not? It's free. Like it doesn't cost the client any more money. And it's not like this extra step that we all have to do. He's like, yeah, like fair point. I agree. I think everyone should do it. It's just a missed opportunity. Either brokers just don't know that you can increase the prepayment to 2020 or they just forget to put it in the submission notes for whatever reason. But that one and automatic limit increase. I was burned of that earlier on in my career. I had no idea that you had to set that up front because if you don't have that, then the line of credit doesn't increase as you pay down the mortgage. So you need to have that in your submission notes for them to actually trigger it. It's not automatic. Yeah. And both of those things in doing it set you up for future opportunities. Like the cascade strategy we teach our agents at Tango through Strategy Hub. You can do the cascade strategy by setting up the 20% prepayment privilege, having the auto limit increase on and the line of credit in place. 
if you don't do those steps though, you can't do that strategy. So you're cutting yourself off at the knees for future revenue opportunities. Yeah, big time. Okay, last but not least, speed kills all deals. So focus on your response times. If your underwriter is calling you, emailing you, texting, however they're reaching out to you, they're looking for an answer because they're looking at your file. If you call them back three hours later, you have to wait till they're looking at your file again. So pick up your phone. I can tell you, I have like one underwriter. If he calls, I don't care if I'm at dinner, I'm picking it up. Like, I don't care (laughs) where I am because I know he's in the file there. He's got a ton of volume he's working on and I'll give him the quick answer he's looking for. So make sure you're treating your underwriters with respect. Give them the VIP priority status and answer them quickly. Put it this way. He probably knows you're going to answer. Like if he's calling at that hour, he probably knows you're going to. If it's another broker, he's like, oh, this guy never answers his phone. I'll just wait until tomorrow to do the rest of this. Like that little thought right there can make or break when you're getting that approval. And I know there's one broker in the space that's very extreme with this. I don't know if I would go this far, but he's mentioned that if he's on a client call, a discovery call, and the underwriter calls him, then he'll actually put the client on hold and answer the underwriter. That's wild. I don't. Yeah, know I don't know if I would do that, that but <laughs> <laughs> even like I know a lot of people want to have a balance in their life, but like this guy would call and text me on weekends, and I'd answer. And now, like I could submit a file tonight at like seven p.m., and he's gonna underwrite it on Saturday morning. That's just like a level of service that when you go back to your client, you're like, yeah, I know you're expecting Monday, but I got your commitment today. And they're like, holy shit, this is amazing. So yeah, I didn't know banks were open on the weekend. Yeah. 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 So big wins you can get that way. All right. So quick recap for you. Don't throw shit at the wall. Start relationships with your BDMs and underwriters. Treat them like valuable members of your team because they are valuable members of your team. To that end, focus on your submission notes, get them dialed in, take the couple extra minutes it takes. And remember, speed kills all deals. Don't wait to hit reply to people. Absolutely, man. And if you have enjoyed this episode and you know someone out there that can use this for help with their files, please share this. We would love for you to help us help you. Thanks, everyone. Cheers.